Alright guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new, my name is Bobby. Guys, triggering video today, how Hinduism lost to Islam by the channel Awaited Hour. Recently, we've seen a lot of hate from Indian neo-nationalists, so-called Hindutva, against Islam. Therefore, I'm very curious to hear a Muslim perspective in today's video. With no further ado, let's have a look. In today's world, there are unfortunately many instances of hatred and discrimination towards Islam and Muslims, with Hindus being As one of the most notorious mentions. groups in yep. their animosity. Their vitriol and propaganda are often used to diminish and dehumanize Muslims, creating an environment of fear and resentment, and paving the way for numerous inhumane crimes against harmless innocents. Absolutely. It has become essential for us Muslims to go on the offensive side by intellectually challenging their beliefs and confronting the ignorance that drives them. In this video, we will explore several stories related to Hinduism and draw insights from them. After that, we will contrast these ideas with fundamental principles of the Islamic creed. It is important to note that the stories referenced in this video have various versions that may differ in their details. It should be obvious to the listener that these stories are works of fiction. And as with any fictional narrative, there can be multiple variations and adaptations of the story. What is important for us is to reflect on the main ideas present in Hindu mythology and compare them to Islam. So is it fictional or not fictional? The first story is about Parvati a Hindu goddess. She wanted a son to keep her company when Shiva, her husband, was away. So she decided to create Ganesha out of the sandalwood paste she used for her bath and breathed life into him. She then instructed Ganesha to stand guard at the entrance while she took her bath. When Shiva returned home and tried to enter the room, he was stopped by the boy who did not recognize him. An angry Shiva cut off the boy's head, not realizing that it was his own son. Upon seeing what had happened, Parvati was devastated and inconsolable. She was filled with grief and anger at the loss of her son. Parvati demanded that Shiva bring Ganesha back to life, and when he could not, she threatened to destroy the universe and all of its creatures in her rage. Shiva then ordered his followers to find the head of the first living creature they came across, and that turned out to be an elephant. He placed the elephant's head on the boy's body, and thus Ganesha was born with the head of an elephant and the body of a boy. Hindus worship Shiva for a variety of reasons. So to stay absolutely respectful towards the Hindus watching and moreover to give them the benefit of the doubt and say those stories are just metaphorical. They're metaphorical, fantastic stories that ultimately teach people certain lessons. All right, that might be the case. However, we do know that Shiva, Krishna, Ganesha and so forth are worshipped by Hindus indeed. And therefore we cannot say that they are just fictional characters. No, people worship those figures. They see them as gods or as manifestations of God. However, as you can see, they have no true power. The father himself didn't recognize his son, so how can he be a God? Moreover, he couldn't bring him back to life. He had to fuse him with an elephant head and make a monster out of him in order to bring him back to life. How can you worship those fallible creatures? Such as wisdom and protection. In the story we just mentioned, Shiva shows qualities of anger, rage, and ignorance which caused him to unknowingly murder his own son. In addition to that, he was incapable of bringing him back to life normally and had to replace exactly. his head with an elephant head. Wow. How can Hindus seek wisdom in Shiva if his rage and anger caused him to kill his own son? How can Hindus seek protection from Shiva if he could not protect his own son out of his ignorance? As for Parvati, she is worshipped for love, fertility, and power. Parvati's love apparently did not prevent her from threatening to completely destroy the entire universe over the loss of her son and her power was not enough to bring him back. Absolutely. Moreover, it shows how emotional she is, how irrational she is, threatening to destroy the whole universe, even if she could do that. Let's give her the benefit of the doubt yet again. But nevertheless, this is a human, a female emotion. She is angry, she is raging, she's angry at her husband. How is this a god? On the other hand, Allah is all-knowing. Nothing in the entirety of existence goes on without his knowledge and his permission. Exactly. Allah says in Surah Fatir, verse 38, 
Allah is also all powerful. If He wants to revive anyone from the dead, He could easily do so. He also says in Surah al Rum, verse 19, Absolutely beautiful to listen to the Quran. Ultimately, it lays out that Allah is the life giver. He creates, He destroys, He has dominion over everything. He's not a fallible person that has flaws. One night, Ganesha was out for a ride on his mount, a rat. Ganesha is often depicted as riding a mouse or a rat. As they were traveling, the moon suddenly appeared from behind a cloud and saw Ganesha. Ganesha was captivated by the moon's beauty and approached it. As he approached the moon, he fell off his mount. This caused the moon to start laughing at him. It is also said that the reason for the moon's mockery was due to Ganesha's big belly and elephant head. The moon <laughs> is often associated with beauty, grace and elegance. So when the moon saw Ganesha's unusual appearance, it found it amusing and started laughing at him. Angered by the Sounds moon's like mockery, a trip to me. Ganesha became so incensed that he cursed the moon, declaring that it would never again be whole. The moon, realizing his mistake, begged Ganesha for forgiveness. Ganesha relented and agreed to lift the curse, but only partially. From that day forward, the moon would wax and wane, growing full for a short time before shrinking back down again. Okay. This story is cited in Hindu mythology as to why the moon appears in different phases throughout the month. Hindus know Ganesha as the remover of obstacles and bringer of success and wisdom. In this story, Ganesha shows qualities of quick temper, rage, weakness, and insecurity. How can Hindus expect Ganesha to remove their obstacles when he wasn't even able to prevent himself from falling off his mount? In Islam, the moon is considered one of the most beautiful signs of Allah. Allah created it with great precision and wisdom so that it can serve the purpose of preserving and maintaining the order of the universe. Allah says in Surah Yunus verse 5, It is He who made the sun a shining radiance and the moon a light, determining phases for it so that you might know the number of years and how to calculate time. Allah did not create all without a purpose. He explains His signs to those who understand. In Islam, the moon doesn't dare disrespect its creator nor mock him. Instead, it exalts him and worships him in a way we do not know. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, verse 4. To be fair here, they don't say that Ganesha created the moon. Nevertheless, they worship Ganesha as a deity. And therefore, of course, the moon would never disrespect a deity higher than itself. It would never disrespect God in that sense. And therefore, Ganesha is not God. Allah says in Surah Al-Isra, verse 44. Seven heavens, 
the earth and all those in them glorify him. There is not so a beautiful. single thing that does not glorify his praises, but you simply cannot comprehend their glorification. He is indeed most forbearing, all yes. forgiving. This is one of my absolute favorite surahs within the Quran and moreover coming from a Christian background, this was news to me. It was so amazing to see that everything glorifies God, that everything worships God, animals, plants, etc. It's just us human beings that have the choice basically, the choice of submitting ourselves to God or rebelling against God. This gives us this absolute freedom in this world and this grand opportunity of course. This is why it's such a blessing to get the chance to be guided by Allah. Vishnu. I know Vishnu all of those characters. Of I used to study Hinduism, Hinduism a bit. He is considered the preserver and protector of the universe responsible for maintaining the cosmic order. According to Hindu mythology, he was once resting under a banyan tree after a long period of work. As he rested, he noticed a beautiful woman walking nearby and became distracted by her beauty. He was so taken with her that he forgot his duties and responsibilities, causing chaos and disorder in the world. <laughs> As Vishnu became more and more distracted by the woman, his wife Lakshmi, the Hindu goddess of wealth and prosperity, became concerned. She went to Vishnu and reminded him of his duty to the universe. She told him that he was responsible for maintaining order and balance in the world and that he needed to focus on his duties in order to prevent chaos from taking over. Vishnu realized his mistake and thanked Lakshmi for reminding him of his responsibilities. He then returned to his role as the preserver of the universe, restoring order and balance to the world. So there are two major flaws within this story if you notice. One is of course that he forgot his responsibility because he was lusting after a woman. That is already extremely outrageous. However, there is another aspect that he rested. He actually needs rest. And we all know that Allah needs no rest whatsoever. He doesn't need to take a break. He is the eternal one. And this is the main difference yet again, that those are human qualities. Those those gods here are flawed. There is a dude chilling under a tree looking after chicks for getting his job. To the world. There are some other versions of the story that depict Vishnu's behavior as adulterous. In these versions, Vishnu is said to have taken the form of the beautiful woman and engaged in a romantic relationship with himself. Hindus worship Vishnu for okay. things like preservation, order, and protection. In this story, Vishnu shows qualities of tiredness, weakness, irresponsibility, and uncontrollable lust. Exactly. What kind of order is Vishnu going to provide if he cannot control his own deep desires? What kind of preservation is he going to provide if he gets tired and requires rest? In Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is exalted beyond tiredness and weakness. Allah never rests and he is ever living, preserving, and sustaining all living things with his mighty power. Exactly right. He is the absolute. So if you pray to anything else than the absolute, you're praying to something lesser than God automatically. What kind of God would it be if this God is not absolutely perfect? Think about it logically. If God has any type of flaw, then he cannot be God anymore. At least this is the concept of God that we worship as Muslims. And it is the only rational concept of God that anybody could truly worship and have respect for. Because if God has flaws like ourself, why would we look up to him? The only reason why our children are looking up to us is because they assume that we are perfect. Of course, later on in life, they're going to be disappointed as well when they find out that we are not perfect. Only God is perfect, of course. Nevertheless, the presupposition is here that the child assumes that we as parents are those perfect role models. Those role models that are worthy to be obeyed. Why would you obey a God that is lusting after women. A God that needs rest is absolutely irrational. Only Islam shows the true perfection, the unity of God. Why would you worship anything less? Allah says in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 255 Allah <laughs> له ما في السماوات وما في الأرض من ذا الذي يشفع عنده إلا بإذنه يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم 
ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حفظهما وهو العلي العظيم the keyword in this surah here for me is the self-sustaining because this distinguishes God clearly from anything else we see in creation. Everything else relies upon sustenance of something else. When you are born, you rely on sustenance of your mother to breastfeed you. Then it continues on. You rely on sustenance of your environment through your parents, of course, to be fed, to be clothed. And everything else around you is dependent. As you can see, the trees are dependent on the sun. Animals are dependent on other animals. Everything eats each other. The only thing independent, the only thing self-sufficient is Allah. Hanuman. Hanuman was a young monkey with a voracious appetite. One day, he was wandering through the forest searching for food when he saw the sun rising in the sky. Hanuman was struck by the beauty of the sun and its bright orange color which he thought resembled that of a ripe fruit. Excited by the prospect of a delicious meal, the graphics Hanuman are really amazing to fly yeah, up and grab the sun. He flew up high into the sky and tried to take a bite of the sun, but he quickly realized his mistake. The sun was far too hot to eat, and Hanuman could not even touch it without getting burned. Surya, the sun god, became angry at Hanuman's foolish act and scolded him for his ignorance. Hanuman realized his mistake and apologized to Surya. Other versions of the story mention that Indra, another... There you see it again, those gods, they have responsibilities, they have certain different jobs. This is how they are explained. They're not explained as the creator of everything. They are creations that have certain power over certain things. The Hindu god struck Hanuman with his thunderbolt as he was approaching the sun and made him unconscious. Hanuman is worshipped for strength courage, and wisdom. His strength, courage, and wisdom, however, did not stop him from mistaking the sun as a fruit and then proceeding to fail to eat it, but instead fall unconscious. In Islam, however, Allah is all-knowing and all-powerful. He does not get hungry. Yeah, and moreover, nor... Allah being the ultimate truth, the ultimate reality, he could never be unconscious. Unconscious, yet again, is a human or an animalistic attribute, of course, where you lose consciousness, where you are not perceiving anything any longer. However, as we know, Allah is the all-seeing. He would never lose consciousness. Does he mistake anything That's ridiculous. for something else? Yeah. No one is capable of striking him unconscious like Hanuman. No one is capable of overpowering him or causing harm to him. There the stories no that other. we have examined today have highlighted the significant differences between the false Hindu gods and Allah, the one true God. The Hindu gods have been depicted with negative qualities such as imprudence, ignorance, and tiredness, whereas Allah is revered for his perfect attributes of power, wisdom, and knowledge. These attributes make Allah the only true God deserving of worship and admiration. By comparing the two, it becomes evident that only Allah possesses the necessary qualities to maintain the universe's order and provide guidance and blessings to his followers. Therefore, we hope that Hindus will recognize the truth presented in this video and replace their animosity towards it with the willingness to follow and worship their creator. By doing so, they can fulfill their life's true purpose and attain eternal happiness. Additionally, we hope that this video has provided Muslims with more love and appreciation towards their creator and the guidance that he has bestowed upon them. Allahu Akbar. All right, this is it for today's video. I have to say, awaited hour, the YouTube channel. Please check it out if you haven't already. Did an amazing job here, especially with the graphics. Absolutely phenomenally done. An artistic, high quality production. Back in the day, I used to study Hinduism, Buddhism, Shamanism, and many other different branches of those religions. I was fascinated by the description of consciousness, by the description of unity, etc., etc. However, if you look into the theology of those doctrines, you will find flaws. As it was beautifully displayed in this video here, of course, we saw that those deities are flawed. And even if they exist, yet again, let's give them the benefit of the doubt. Let's say that those entities are real. 
they are surely not gods. Who knows what they are? We, of course, will take the position and say that they must be jinns. And when you see them depicted, oftentimes they are frightening or in sexual positions. So we can only assume that they are malicious entities, some evil entities. And by listening to the Hindu texts here, we can only be confirmed in this assumption, of course, because they are displayed as being evil, as being angry, as being jealous, being sexually deviant, lusting after other people. So all of those attributes are clearly flaws. They're not beautiful attributes. They're not the 99 perfect names of Allah. Of course not. Those attributes show that those entities are malicious and are far away from being perfect. And therefore the question becomes yet again, how can you worship something with a clear conscience that has those lesser desires? People nowadays will give the argument and say that Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was a warlord or who he had multiple women and therefore he was following his desires don't you see First and foremost, we can of course discredit that argument, but that being said, even if we would give him the benefit of the doubt and say, yes, all of this is true, which is not, then we still would have to remind them that nobody, nobody is worshipping Prophet Muhammad. In Islam, worship is to Allah alone, to God alone. This is the main difference here. If you compare Islam to other religions, you will see that other religions worship either people or deities. People worship the Buddha, people worship Jesus, people worship Krishna, Shiva, Parvati, Ganesha and what not. Don't you see it is always directed away? away from God. And because they do that, they worship people and entities and creation. This is why they point the finger and they say, oh, but did you know Prophet Muhammad did this and that? Yeah, that's the whole point, guys. You are worshiping the creation. We are worshiping the creator. All right, guys, but this is it for today's video. If you liked it, leave it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed already, guys, please do so. And if you want to support this channel by Patreon, for example, all the links are in the description box below. Thank you so much for your ongoing support, guys. And as always, may God bless you all. Much love and peace.